I always said to myself, the moment that I knew that I had made it as sort of a local uh, writer, uh, artist, you know, it was the moment when I, I was at Sunfest. And, you know, Roy was always at Sunfest standing, you know, in his spot, you know, talking to everybody. I, remember, I walked up behind him and he hadn't seen me. And, uh, and I, I overheard him talking to these other people. He's saying, did you see the article that Jeremy Hobbs wrote about me? He's a good friend of mine here. It's in Q Magazine. And he was handing these photocopies out. And I thought, I finally made it in this town. Uh, so, um, so I suppose it's no secret uh, that Roy liked to talk about himself. Uh, but he was also a tremendous listener, uh, as was also pointed out last week at his funeral. About um, seven or eight years ago, in 2011, I actually sustained a brain injury. It's really weird to talk about, but I actually wound up with brain damage. And as weird as that is to say, uh, I, I was really in a bad state for a while. And basically, I had like severe retrograde amnesia. And so I, I kind of, I was still, I was still aware of like, you know, who the prime minister was and the multiplication tables and how to drive a car and everything. But I had a, almost like no recollection of my childhood or my, like, I was just in a sort of a like daze. And I didn't think I was ever going to be able to write anything again. Uh, I just thought I was game over for me, and, and, and it took quite a, a, a bit of time before I started kind of going downtown again and kind of going out in public and trying to integrate myself back into places. And so the first thing I did was I bought a fringe festival pass. Because I thought, this is an excuse to be downtown and be around people and stuff, uh, but not actually really have to say anything they would to communicate, because I didn't know how I was going to explain like what was going on in my head. And I remember I was coming out of Bookworm, Corin Raymond's Bookworm, a great play, and uh, I ran into Roy, and he was kind of like, hey, he started talking to me. He said, what, are, are you, you don't seem right, you know? And so I remember we sat down uh, on the steps, and, and I told him this whole story of what had happened to me and everything I would deal with stuff, and, and he didn't say a word the whole time. He just sat there nodding at me, like with the most like empathy I'd ever seen like on another human's face. And he just was so concerned and so sympathetic and, and he was so kind to me afterwards. And, and that's when uh, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out this little salmon colored stone. And I'm sure like a lot of you people have one of these things yourself, but he said that he carries these stones around, called them friendship stones. He say like give them to people that, that he'd gotten to know, that he sort of considered like were friends of his or people that he kind of, you know, had gotten closer to than, than just the average person. And he handed me this thing and he said, I, you know, I consider you my friend. And I want you to have the stone. I still have. I want. I want to like reach in my pocket and pull it out, but it's actually at my parents' house. So I didn't have time to drive all the way across town to get it. But I do have this thing. I've held on to it ever since then. Um, Roy um, was a bit of a cipher for a while. You know, he always thought like you never knew where he came from. He was always around. He thought, does he sleep? Like, does he have a home? Like, he just seemed to, to always be there. Like, you're expecting him to walk around the corner. And so he's kind of like this mythological figure to me. But the time, the day that he actually became a real human being to me was this one time, uh, Jason Ripp and I, uh, I don't know if we, I think it was maybe after he remounted the play, we heard that he'd written about Roy, we were all having drinks at the Blackshire patio on Talbot when the Blackshire still existed, and uh, and Roy wandered by, and we were playing, hey Roy, you know, come, you know, come sit down with us, you know, we had this table and everything, and he was really hesitant to come into the bar, and, and we didn't understand why he was being so kind of, uh, you know, skips, but then a, a couple hours later I would totally understand why, but we did manage to get him to come in, and he sat down beside me. And he was very serious. He was usually telling jokes and reciting poems and stuff. But, you know, I'd never really seen him like this before. We just started talking, and he started telling me about his whole life, like in a very open, forthcoming manner. He started telling me all about, you know, his relatively strict religious upbringing and how awkward he was as a teenager and his, his initial shyness around uh, women and his views on life and death. And then, and then his wild years in Montreal, which is a whole other thing. Don Bell wrote a whole book about it called Pocket Man. Um, and then his, uh, his battle with alcoholism and then his eventual decision to get clean. And when he finally decided to, to get clean, he remained sober for the entire rest of his life. Uh, you know, for decades, never touched again. And I, I really felt like um, that day, oh, when he left, I really felt like I really knew him as a man, you know, not just as this interesting figure about town, you know, but as a real person. I had a real well-rounded, you know, um, perspective on his life. Uh, up to that point by then, so I always really appreciate that. Um, a few years ago, um, I moved to the south end of town, and that's when Roy and I actually became neighbors. Not next door neighbors, but uh, theoretical neighbors. Um, I, uh, I'd always lived downtown, uh, but I, I was living out in the south end, and um, everywhere I went was Roy McDonald. You know, I'd go into McDonald's, and there was Roy getting a coffee, I'd go into Starbucks, you got to go to Metro to get groceries. Roy was standing there talking to the, the, the checkout people. And he introduced me to every single like barista and checkout person and drive-through window operator in the entire south end of town. And they all knew him by name. 
Uh, my favorite South Bend memory of Roy uh, is my friend Ron and I went into McDonald's one night. It was really late. It was like 3 in the morning or something. We went into that 24-hour McDonald's. We are standing there for about 10 minutes before uh, Ron says, hey, is that, is that Roy McDonald over there? We see Roy sitting at this table right beside this little fiery heart. He's just staring at us, you know, like, you know, come on over. So we're like, hey, Roy, like, what are you doing? And, and he says, I, I, I really want to show you this book of mine. I want to show you this book. And he pulls this big tome out of his bags, this big, huge, heavy book. And it says something like, I don't know what it's called, like, the Forest City or the History of the Forest City or London Ontario. Because this book was written by a friend of mine, 1975 or something like that, right? It's, it's all about London, Ontario. It's like, just stop. You know, really, open it up, open it up. So we're kind of like, it takes two of us to lift it, you know? And he's like, just go, go to the M section, go to the M section. And uh, and this is a paraphrase here, it's not verbatim, but we flip to the M section, we see McDonald, comma, Roy. He says, go on, go on. We read it, it says something like, Roy McDonald is a local busker and poet whose writings detail his interactions with the everyday people he encounters during his daily travels through the city. Roy can usually be found in the wee hours of the night, sitting at his favorite table at the Wellington Commissioner's McDonald's. So we had this like meta Twilight Zone moment where there we were at the Wellington Commissioner's McDonald's and Roy's sitting there at his favorite table reading about in this book from like 30 years ago. It was really a strange, uh, a really strange moment. So, uh, you know, about a month ago or so, uh, I heard from Julie McDonald, Roy's cousin, who most of you know, and she asked me if I'd seen Roy in a while. She said she hadn't heard from him in a long time. She talked to a lot of his friends and that you know he hadn't been around. And, and I said I hadn't seen him in a while either. And I said, you want me to go into detective mode, kind of uh, you know see see what I can dig up? And she said yes. And so the first thing I did was uh, go to all the places, McDonald's and Starbucks and everything. And uh, I found that everyone in there was just as concerned as we were. You know, as soon as I mentioned his name. All the staff came out from the kitchen stuff and were like, have you seen Roy? You know, we've been really worried about him and not. Uh, and I guess customers have been coming in and asking about him and everything. And it just shows you, you know, how loved and how, you know, how well known he was by everyone. And not just downtown, but in all the, I've seen him in Masonville in chapters and stuff before. And uh, obviously um, our, our search turned up somewhat tragic results. But anyone that was at the funeral last week for Roy um, knows that, that it was anything but tragic. Uh, someone on the internet even joked that Roy put the fun back at the funeral. I, I, I've been to a lot of funerals. I, I have a pretty big family, and so I unfortunately was at a, a lot of funerals when I was young. And um, I have to say that this funeral for Roy last week was the nicest, most like strangely joyous funeral I'd ever been to before. Everyone came out, you know, and we're just sharing all the stories they loved about Roy and funny moments and all these great things. There's no religious officials, just a stream of, of people that knew Roy and loved Roy. You know, Bill Paul did a wonderful job, you know, emceeing, I don't know if that's the official word for it, uh, the proceedings that got everyone up, uh, a lot of whom have spoken today. And everyone told all these hilarious stories and, and just wonderful moments and had nothing but love for him. And, and then we all signed his casket with colored Sharpies and went to uh, the cemetery and we all stood around and, and Bill Paul led us in uh, a sing-along of uh, Frank Sinatra's My Way. Uh, and it was really something. I mean, there was so much love and joy. I mean, for once this was a funeral where people weren't just moping around and, and being sad. I mean, everybody was focusing on, you know, just all the fun times we shared and, and what, a, what a great, wonderful soul Roy McDonald was. Uh, it's safe to say, I think, that downtown London will never be the same. I said in the piece I wrote, it seems like there's a Roy-shaped hole in the city now. Every time I go downtown or drive past Joe Pools and Richmond Row, I'm, I'm expecting him to, to walk back out again. Everybody's been, uh, you know, joking around, oh, who's going to be the next Roy? Who's going who's to pick up the torch? You know, who's going to become the next Roy McDonald? And the truth is, no one replaced Roy. You know, I mean, Roy McDonald was a one-of-a-kind person, you know, and, and, and there is no other Roy, but the one thing we can do is we can keep the spirit of Roy alive in this town. And Roy loved people. I mean, anyone who knew, knew how much he loved people, he loved meeting new people, he loved introducing people to each other. So anytime two people stop and have a conversation on Richmond Row, Roy is with them. Anytime you bend down to pet someone's dog at Sunfest, Roy is with you. Anytime you know you stop and tell someone about an article you've written or a play you're directing or a concert you're playing, Roy is there with you. Um, and that's that's what we can do for him. Uh, Roy was a no compromise individual who lived his life 100% on his own terms. Some people loved him. Some people didn't quite understand him. But one thing is for certain, no one ever forgot him. So here's a Roy McDonald, a Bohemian poet. Unofficial Mayor Richmond Rowe and a man I was more than proud to call my friend.